tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about cadaverous caverns and dire dissections. Also, I'm excited to say that both of tonight's tales are once again Chilling Tales exclusives, debuting with us here tonight, meaning you won't have heard them anywhere else. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and oh, is it good to be back. Tonight, I resume my role as your personal guide to the paranormal. Join me, won't you, as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Accompanying us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Heath Pfaff and Kitty Olson, our voice talents Paul J. McSorley and Luke Fisher. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Heath Pfaff and is performed by Paul J. McSorley. In it, we'll be introduced to a pair of young boys in search of a little supernatural harmless magic. They enter into a cave system, hoping to find a fairy knoll. But when these boys fall into this proverbial rabbit hole, will they both find their way out and live to tell the tale? Without further ado, I present to you the Knoll. This doesn't look safe. I looked into the cave that cut into the side of the massive round hill. Above it, a tree had grown roots downward trying to fill up the void, but it had instead simply created a fanciful framing, like something out of a story that started with the words, Once Upon a Time. I never guaranteed it would be safe. I said it would be an adventure. And when was the last time you heard about a safe adventure? Adam wasn't exactly wrong, and I had been the one to say that I was bored. You also said you were going to show me a fairy knoll, and instead we are looking at a cave, I pointed out. I grabbed the flashlight from my belt and checked to make sure it was in working order. Shining it into the cave, the beam of light traveled until it reached a dead end. The crazy number of lumens the thing was capable of was almost dazzling while looking into the darkness of the cave. I flipped it to a lower light level and snapped it to my shoulder. The cave goes into the knoll. Look, hills like this, these ones that seem perfectly round, like a bubble sitting on an otherwise flat area, are fairy knolls. Back when fairy creatures still wandered the forest, I don't think that ever happened, actually. I interjected, which caused Adam to glare at me. Not all of us are as close-minded as you are, he informed me. Anyway, the fairy royalty would build their kingdoms into these places, and they would come out to dance and party under the moonlight, then retreat back into the caves at dawn. The knolls were all interconnected, woven through passages that connected to similar hills all over the world. So you're hoping to find little fluttering fairies in these caves and not, um, bears? Because this is black bear territory. Before he could answer, I added, 
Also, I'm certain we passed a few posted signs on the way here. Adam, are we trespassing? That's a weird way to say adventuring, my friend. Adam looks sincerely disappointed in me. Besides, it's only really trespassing if you're caught. I don't think that is a legally defensible argument. I sighed and shrugged. I was in this thing, even if I was giving Adam a hard time. We had been friends since we were in the second grade, and I had always let Adam drag me into trouble. The thing was, the trouble always ended in great memories. How did you even find this place? I saw the hill from the road on bike and had to find a way to get in here. It took me ages to find a good route to hike in, but it was worth it. This cave is even better than the last one I found. His excitement was barely contained. The last one was more of a hole in a rock with a bunch of spiders inside, so... I threw my backpack on and turned to the cave. Every cave is just a hole in a rock with a bunch of spiders. I think that is literally the definition of a cave. Now come on, stop bitching and adventure. Adam started off ahead of me, walking headlong into the unknown with his normal reckless abandon. I looked back to where I'd left my car hidden in some nearby brush. I missed it already. Eventually though, as I always did, I came following after. Passing beneath the curtain of roots from the tree over the entrance did give the impression of passing from one world into another. Adam had a spool of string with him. He tied the end to one of the roots and then hung the spool from a peg on his belt. This was a clever trick he had started doing when he began wandering through unfamiliar woods. He carried several spools and just kept connecting them as he went. On the way back, he'd wind them up, but he never got lost. Not anymore. When we were younger, we had gotten lost a few times. I half expected this cave to come to a dead end after 10 or 20 feet inside. What were the odds of stumbling into a major cave system by accident? When we got further inside and discovered that the cave narrowed and turned to the left, I wasn't sure if I was happy or worried. Adam was clearly excited by the prospect of a longer adventure. See, fairy knoll, it will spread all through this hill. Let's go find some fairies. Adam flashed his uneven grin at me, uneven because of an accident with a moped his senior year of high school. I gave a look back over my shoulder at the dwindling light of the world beyond the caves, realizing that following this curve would block out the last of the natural light and then proceeded after Adam. We had his string, we could find our way out, though it occurred to me that a cave of this size could very easily be a home to all kinds of dangerous animals. Caves like this were perfect homes for large predators. We passed a branch in the path and Adam took us down the left side. It was strange how much like a hall it felt. The ground was easy enough to walk on and the paths, though narrow in places, were comfortably sloped. It felt like we had been walking for quite a while. I wished I had checked my cell phone to see what time it was when we entered. I pulled it out and gave a look at the time. It was two in the afternoon. The best I could guess was that we'd been in the cave for 15 minutes. It really was deep, though it didn't seem to move downwards. We reached another branch and again Adam chose the left-hand side. There was a faint unpleasantness in the air and it almost felt like Adam was following that for some reason. I looked back down the string trail. I was glad for it. Though, so far, it would be easy enough to find our way back. Two rights and then straight on out. Oh shit! Adam shouted and I jumped, splashing the cave in shadows as my flashlight arm went astray. What? I shouted, more angry than scared now that I had had a moment to gather myself. Adam laughed a little. Sorry, rat. It was a big one though. Ran right over my foot. I sighed. Maybe we should just go back. I don't know what you're hoping to find in this hole in the ground. A little fairy girlfriend? I asked, shifting my flashlight so that I could see more of the cave we were in. The narrow passageway we had just been in had opened out into a larger area. The stink had been getting stronger, and now it was quite bad. Come on, a little further. I want to know what that smell is. Adam urged me on, ever chasing the next terrible smell. Smells like roadkill, and that worries me. I know I joked about bears earlier, but what if there is a bear in here? I was becoming increasingly worried about that. The carcass smell, the rat, 
that could easily mean we were walking into a bear den. I had brought bear mace, but I didn't want to find out if it had ever actually been tested on actual bears. I didn't figure this was the best time to find out either way. Bears? No, what? No way. It's too deep. Bears don't live this deep in caves, Adam explained in such a way that I knew he had no idea what he was talking about. He was moving on again and I was following him. It was difficult to determine which of us was the biggest idiot. Adam for leading us into danger or me for following Adam into danger despite the fact that I knew better. The area around us was opening up even wider so that I could no longer see the walls in my beam. Adam stopped. Oh man, you were right. About what? Tell me it's not the bears, I said, trying to decide if I should start running in the other direction. I reached into my pack and dug for the bear spray just to be safe. I felt better with it in my hand. No, the roadkill thing. Well, I mean, it's probably not roadkill, but there are animal carcasses. Look. He flashed his light ahead and I could see the mangled body of a deer. It had been disemboweled and spread across the ground. Hunks were missing from its flesh, differing sizes of damage. Some were small marks, like maybe the rat we had seen before, and some were much larger. There were other dead animals too. I saw a coyote, several rabbits, and a raccoon. All of them were partially eaten, in various states of decay. I think I was right about the bear too, I said quietly. Adam, I really think we should get out of here now. Anything that dragged a deer in here is something we don't want to run into. Adam turned towards me, sweeping his light into my face. Shit! I cursed, putting a hand up to block the blinding flash. Sorry, Adam apologized, and the light fell off back to the side, and for a half a second, I saw something on the ground. You're right, we should be getting out of here. I guess this is just a bear cave. I barely heard him. I turned in the direction that his light had flashed, bringing my own beam down in that direction. At first it was hard to tell what I was seeing, but I got a bit closer and soon it was apparent. Is that a bone pile? Adam asked, coming up behind me. It was. The pile was above my waist and it stretched off to one side of the chamber. I flashed my light across it and it filled the room all the way into a tunnel far at the opposite end from where we had come into the cave. I had never seen so many bones in one place. I couldn't identify half of them. Bone identification wasn't exactly a class they offered me back in college, but some things stuck out. Him bear must be hungry, Adam was saying, but I was already shaking my head. No, Adam, that's a bear skull. I pointed to one of the larger skulls atop the pile. The canines were a dead giveaway. They were far too big to be a dog. It had been a really big black bear. Whatever did this ate the bear. Adam laughed and then he seemed to catch on to my lack of laughter and he just said, Oh, oh shit. No. Is that a human skull? He pointed at the pile and it took me a moment to figure out exactly what he was looking at but then I spotted the eye sockets and the rest of it came into focus. There was no mistaking that one. We turned together and started back for the tunnel we had entered through. Adam was rolling up his string quickly as we went. Good adventure, right? He said as he worked, punctuating the words with nervous laughter. As long as we don't get eaten, I will call it a good adventure. I tried to keep my answer light, but it was easy to spook yourself in the dark, especially in a cave with human bones. The bones had pushed me well into the neighborhood of spooked. Something quick and dark darted past the edge of my flashlight beam. It gave me a start, but I cursed quietly to myself and kept moving. Rats. They had come for the meat. I wished them the best in their endeavor, but I, for one, didn't want to become a member of the bone pile crew. We reached the first intersection and followed the string left. I kept looking over my shoulder, certain that something would be back there but I couldn't see anything. Behind us, where our flashlights didn't reach, was a blackness so profound that trying to find anything in it caused the mind to stutter. There was nothing to grasp onto. We kept traveling as fast as we could, and then we reached an area that looked like a carved out set of stairs leading upward. We stopped together. 
Had we come down an area that looked like stairs? The string was still leading up this way. The string. We had followed the string. I frowned as I tried to understand what was happening. Adam started up the steps in front of me. Adam, I don't think we should go up there. We didn't come downstairs to get where we were. Why had the rope led us left at the first intersection? It should have taken us down the right branch. We had turned left to get there to begin with. That doesn't make sense. How would the string get moved? I never felt anything. It has to be right. Maybe we just forgot. He was at the top of the stairs now, looking around with his flashlight. Hey, I think I see a light down this way, he said, moving further away. Hey, let's just try and backtrack and... I didn't get any further than that because Adam screamed. Son of a bitch! Holy shit! He sounded like he was in pain, so I dashed up the stairs to see what was wrong. Adam was clutching the side of his face near his right eye, screaming as he walked in circles. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, it hurts! He yelled at me. What hurts? What's wrong? I ran over to him, trying to see where he was injured, but he had it covered with his hand and I couldn't tell what was bothering him. You have to let me see. I can't help you if you don't show me. I tossed my pack down and was opening it, grabbing out the first aid kit. I set the bear mace down for a moment. I figured he must have hit his head on something. Adam pulled his hands back and let loose a groan of agony, the likes of which I had never heard from him, and I'd been there when he broke his leg skateboarding. I squinted to figure out what I was seeing. The flesh around Adam's eye was bright red, as though he had been in the sun for far too long. It was also puffing up badly. His eye was almost entirely shut already. I looked closer, moving the flashlight in, but I couldn't tell what the heck was causing the swelling. I moved the light and saw a momentary shimmer. I squinted and moved it again, and then I saw it. There was a little strand stuck in Adam's skin, just a little behind his eyebrow. It was almost transparent, only slightly thicker than a piece of hair, but stiff. It looked like a sliver of glass, but it was long. I reached forward to try and grab it, but the moment I touched it, I jumped back in pain. My fingers had thin cuts in them where I'd touched the sliver. They were even bleeding lightly. What the hell? I muttered under my breath, but in the next moment I saw the sliver begin to crawl into Adam's flesh as though it was dragging itself deeper. Adam began to scream again. What is it? What is it? He yelled. It burns, oh God, it burns! I don't know what it is, I told him in a panic. It's some kind of sliver, a little narrow thing like a piece of thin glass. We have to get out of here. Come on, let's go back down these stairs. Adam collapsed to his knees and began to scream even louder. My heart was hammering in my chest. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea how to help my friend. The red blotch on his face was growing, turning purple and almost black in some places. What could do this to a person? Adam, you have to walk. We have to get out of here. I told him, reaching down to grab his arm and urge him up, but he slapped me away. Something inside of the swelling exploded, and I thought it was probably his eyeball. Black ichor poured down the side of his face, and then the skin on that side of his face began to tear. The odor that came from the wound turned my stomach. It ruptured forcefully, hunks of rotten flesh falling away as it began to drain out onto the ground. I could see Adam's skull, and that too was turning black and soft. He collapsed, finally going quiet, and I sat there staring in horror as his skull crumpled and black moldering brain poured out. Something dark darted from along the path and moved towards the body. My first inclination was to think it was a rat, but it wasn't. It moved on four legs, but they were insect-like, blacker than night, just like its torso, which rose from the center of those four legs. Its head was a black shard with horns atop it, but no eyes, and a mouth that was all teeth. It skittered towards Adam and opened its mouth, grabbing onto his hand. It tore a piece of his flesh and blended it into pulp in that grinder of a mouth. Then others came. They came from the walls, pouring down the tunnels and clawing their way to the body as I slowly backed away. They were about the size of one of my open hands. One of them moved in my direction. It had a single arm that ended in what looked like a little pointed spiral. It pointed that spiral at me. On some random impulse, I put my arm up. A strange popping sound came from the little creature, and when the thread-like projectile hit, 
It burrowed into the band on my watch, and fortunately not my flesh. I grabbed the clasp and tore the watch off just in time to see the tip of that little dart come ripping through the watch band. It had tiny legs that crawled forward. I dropped the watch, grabbed my mace and pack, and ran. I went back down the stairs and then down the hall taking the next left. That, I thought, would put me back on the proper course. I ran through the dark, a strange chittering at my back. Fairies. These things were fairies. How the tales had ever shifted to turn them into little child-friendly characters, I had no idea. These things were nightmares. Oh no, Adam. Adam was gone. Music started down the halls, though perhaps music wasn't the best term. It was like something had heard music once and only once and then had tried to emulate that memory with none of the proper tools or knowledge. I had been moved by music before to the point where it almost made me cry, and this sound was like that, but instead of crying, the noise made me want to stop and dance. It made me feel light of heart. It made me want to go and see where this otherworldly sound was coming from. In fact, I caught myself just standing in the tunnel. I wasn't sure how long I'd been there, unmoving and in a trance, but I was certain that it had been far too long. I began to move again, the music still pulling at me, trying to persuade me to come back. I thought I was resisting it. I really believed that I was headed for the way out. But then I found myself in the room of bones again, and this time I wasn't alone. When I first saw them, I thought perhaps the stories of elves and fairies were somewhat accurate. They stood with light behind them, and they were only a silhouette to my eyes. However, when I shifted my flashlight up to them, I soon realized they were nothing of what they seemed. Their outline hid a truth so alien that I struggled to understand what they were. Each one was as tall as I was, and they stood atop a set of chitinous legs that tucked together in such a way to make them seem like two normal legs. But there were six of them that adjoined to a long, narrow body lined in clawed appendages about the length of a man's forearms. Their larger forearms were long and narrow, ending in three fingers that at first seemed as long as a human's, but again, those folded out into three saber-like claws. Their heads were made up of a set of wind chambers, something like a group of bell-shaped flutes that rose through the area that should have been a face. This was how they made their music, I realized, and why it sounded like nothing of our world. How could it? when these things were clearly nothing like mankind had known before. They had black eyes dashed across their head and torso, small dots peering in a hundred different directions, and their mouths were just gaping holes in their necks that were lined with mismatched teeth. Some were human-like, some pointed like a dog's, and some looked like they belonged to animals I'd never seen or heard of. There were eight of them in the room, and I could tell that they were all focused on me. They all began to sing at once, and the sound hit me like a wave. Human, a voice hummed, more insect buzz than actual human tone. You are among the fae. We have collected your gift, drank of its sweet nectar. Now we will return your favor. The voice was like a hooked line passing through my head, ripping at my thoughts as it tore its way through the back of my skull. What gift were they talking about? I tried to understand what they meant, what was happening, but the only thing I could think of was Adam. Did they think I had brought Adam for them? One of the things moved forward, extending a clawed hand in my direction. Take our hand, child. We will lead you to Elfheim. You will know such delights. The voices fell apart again, returning to the madness of the face song. It tugged at me, trying to pull me towards the offered hand. Some lucid part of my mind acted out of a sense of self-preservation. The music of the creatures faltered, and the air was filled with unpleasant screeching. It was only as the music faded that I saw that my arm was raised and that I was spraying the bear mace at the creatures in the cave. Run! I actually said the word aloud, and then I was doing exactly that. I turned and fled back the way I'd come almost tripping over the bone mound in my haste. A group of black shapes came climbing out of the dark, raising tiny spiked arms in my direction. I dove away from them before they could fire their little darts at me. I heard them go off, 
tiny pops like someone cracking their knuckles, and then I charged forward and kicked them, scattering them out of my way. One hopped up onto my leg and took a bite out of the side of it, chewing through the pants with no problem at all. I screamed and smacked it away, which resulted in more flesh tearing, but managed to dislodge the I ran, taking the first right and crashing over my own feet to sprawl on my knees. The can of bear mace rolled away from me and I went chasing after it as I heard an awful skittering sound from the tunnel behind me. Fear propelled me. I got up and ran again, leaving the bear mace behind me. I wasn't sure it would work a second time anyway. I hit the next junction and took a right again, but I could hear them getting closer. The song was starting up again. The strangely powerful and enchanting music grabbed hold of me and tried to turn me in place. I thought of Adam, the way he had died, and I kept moving. It was like trying to swim up a waterfall. The struggle was so hard that I barely noticed the point at which I stumbled from the cave and landed in the sun of the woods beyond the creeping curtain roots of the tree. I gasped for breath, feeling as though something had been sitting on my chest this entire time. In a panic, I clambered back to my feet and turned around. The cave was dark. I flashed my light down the tunnel, and there, at the back of the cave, stood a human-looking figure. In the shadows, as far away as it was, it could have been anything. You can't leave. A sing-song voice rippled up out of the cave. You will forget us, but we won't forget you. I turned away and started back for the car. I had no idea what I would tell people about Adam. I knew I couldn't tell them the truth. No one would believe me. Maybe some of our friends would listen. I'd have to tell them something. By the time I got the car started, I felt exhausted. I was almost happy that Adam hadn't shown up today after all. I wasn't in the mood for one of his adventures. They were always more trouble than the story that came out of them was worth. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelm. What's your thing? Everybody's got a thing. So what's yours? Is it spending hours observing the cold, calculating determination of insects as they toil and labor endlessly at the behest of primeval instinct, never truly knowing why, or even possessing the most rudimentary concept of self? That's probably not your thing, because that's my thing. And my things tend not to be the things of others. That is, unless you're not doing anything tomorrow night. Wink. No, by your thing, I mean things like sitting in a corner, the lights out, head in hands, shaking uncontrollably, wondering where it all went wrong. Is that your thing? Oh, good. Well, then how do you feel about blacking out the windows and sleeping for 16 hours a day? Or maybe you enjoy just letting your inbox and voicemail pile up because the anxiety of seeing what you might be missing is worse than the anxiety of missing what you might be missing. So if any of these things sound familiar, or if they may actually be one of your things, well, you probably should talk to somebody. And when things such as these things start interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, and by the by, the thing with the emails and the voicemails piling up, yeah, that was me. And if that's you too, maybe send me an email. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. But back on track. Yes, you need someone to talk to who's not me. Someone who's a licensed professional therapist, maybe. Maybe one you met through a convenient, confidential, and affordable online service. A bit like... BetterHelp? Ah, that's the one. Yes, BetterHelp. Because we all need someone to talk to who's not family, friend, co-worker, or me. But even though I never check my messages or my email, rest assured, I'm rooting for you. But BetterHelp, so easy, so fast, all you gotta do is go online to betterhelp.com, do a quick assessment, and bang, you are talking to a licensed professional therapist in under 24 hours. Pretty darn good. Not a crisis line, though. Definitely not self-help. It is professional therapy done online without any time spent in an uncomfortable waiting room. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and guess what? Financial aid is available. 
But Jason, you ask in that email you sent me three months ago, where can I find this convenient, professional, affordable online therapy? Well, it's online, so it's kind of everywhere. And they've got the right person for whatever issue you might be dealing with. From depression, to stress, to anxiety, to relationship, to insects, to sleeping, to trauma, to anger, to family conflicts, to insects, and uh, grief and self-esteem. And just to set the record straight, I am not 100% confident that BetterHelp does have therapists who specialize in insects, but if there was one anywhere, it'd be on BetterHelp. And guess what? If your therapist doesn't work out, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And believe me, there's a lot there. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So if any of this sounds like your thing, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that is betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support at this program and at the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed The Null, as written by Heath Pfaff and voiced by Paul J. McSorley. To find more from Heath Pfaff, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash pfaff, spelled P-F-A-F-F and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find ways to follow him on his website, offoxesmind.com, as well as a link to his work on amazon.com. By clicking his Amazon link on that profile, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. Voice actor Paul J. McSorley's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also find more of Paul's work by visiting Audible and checking out his many audiobooks. Just go to audible.com and type Paul J. McSorley into the search bar. That's Paul J. M. C. S. O. R. L. E. Y. You'll be glad that you did. And after you drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard about him here on this show. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by Kitty Olson and performed by Luke Fisher. In it, we'll be introduced to a woman struggling to balance a fledgling career with a new living situation, but issues that arise in her apartment are less than favorable, and the tenants that cohabitate the building turn out to be even worse. They say that home is where the heart is, but we just might be about to find out how false that statement can be. Without further ado, I present to you, there's a seam in everything. There's a seam in everything. Seven years ago, I... I met the girl who could find them. I... You've got to see what Danny can do! I let myself be dragged across the park, past the swings and to the big oak tree, where a girl with long black hair sat with a pile of books beside her. She looked up at the small crowd of fellow children surrounding her, sighed and set down her book. Can I help you? My best friend at the time, Jacob, beamed and plopped a stuffed bear on her lap. Come on, do the thing! Oh, Luca hasn't seen you do it yet! Danny looked at me, and my gaze immediately went to my shoes. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, I murmured, feeling embarrassed about all the fuss my friend was causing. Jacob scoffed and crossed his arms. You don't even know what she does yet! Come on, Danny, show him! I don't mind showing you, she said before picking up the bear. She brushed her fingers against its face. 
and she smiled before she took her middle finger and ran it from the top of its head to its tummy. And like she'd taken a sharp knife to it, the bear split open, revealing white stuffing and the red heart that had been stuffed in there when Jacob got it. She lifted it to show all of us, before plopping it back on her lap and running her finger along the tear. When she pulled her hand away, the bear was whole again, like she'd never ripped it open. Jacob scooped the bear back up and turned to me. Cool, right? He asked. I shrugged. I don't know, I guess, I said, knowing I probably looked less than convinced. Danny smiled then and got to her feet. Okay, what do you want to see the inside of? She asked. I glanced around the playground before... Uh, before pointing to the swing set. That... Can you cut that with your finger? I asked. I might have only been a kid, but I, I was definitely not convinced by just cloth. Danny nodded and walked over, the crowd of kids following her in awe. She patted the chain of the pink swing before her finger sliced right through one of the links. The chain came free, and then she proceeded to slice open the plastic of the seat. She picked up the mangled swing, spinning around to show how it really wasn't attached at all, before she reattached it, all with the touch of her finger. And now that convinced me. I probably looked like an idiot, just standing there with my jaw dropped while everyone else just clapped. How... how do you do that? I asked in wonder. Danny shuffled her feet, a small smile on her lips. Everything has a seam I can pop open. I can do it to anything, she admitted. I dug through my pockets and managed to pull out my 3DS. Can you open this up? I asked. For the rest of the afternoon, Danny demonstrated her unique and bizarre powers to us. She did. Open up my 3DS, showing off all of the electronics inside. And once she fixed it back up, it booted up. Just like nothing had happened. She opened up a Rubik's Cube, a part of a branch, the monkey bars. Whatever we asked, she would demonstrate. Only if no adults were close, though. One of the other kids suggested she open up one of the cars in the parking lot. And she refused. One by one, we all went home for dinner, until it was just Danny and me. I was pretty awkward at that age, so we just stood in silence for an uncomfortably long time before I finally piped up with the question on my mind. What do you want to open up? She stared at me in surprise for a bit, before she shrugged. I... I, I don't know. I don't do it for myself anymore, I just, I, I just do it, so everyone else likes me, she said. I popped down on the ground and pulled out my 3DS. I, I don't have to be home for a while longer, my parents are working late. You want to play some games with me? I asked. I don't think anyone really asked Danny to do something with them before that didn't involve her cutting some random object open but she slowly nodded and sat beside me. And until it got dark, we played games. Probably would have stayed out longer if the red light signifying the battery didn't start glaring at us. I'll, uh, I'll come back and play with you tomorrow. Okay, I said, sticking it in my pocket. Danny was... Grinning from the ear to ear, her smile filled with joy. I I'd like that, Luca, she said. That summer, I spent a lot of time in the park. Of course, it was fun watching Danny cut open whatever object we brought her, but it was more fun just talking with her. She was a nice girl, after all, just quiet. 
there were several times I'd be playing my 3DS while she watched, and she'd end up falling asleep on my shoulder. She told me most nights she spent wandering around her home rather than sleeping. She never slept well. Then one day, I went to the park while it was raining. I had the stomach ache of a lifetime, but I, I wanted to see Danny, and she was there. As always, the rain was more of a mist rather than a downpour, but I was more than glad to take a seat under the tree. Danny, of course, immediately picked up that something was off. What's wrong? You don't look so good, she asked, pulling her knees up to her chest. Stomach. Mom said there's a flu going around, so don't get too close, I said. What, are you'll barf all over me? Danny giggled before something clicked in that head of hers. Uh, Luca, you know when you asked me earlier this summer what I'd really want to open the seam of? I nodded. I... I lied. I... I kind of want... She blushed a little and murmured the following sentence so quietly I could barely make it out. I kind of want to see if a person has a seam. I responded by wiggling out of my t-shirt. Sure! Maybe you can see what's wrong with my stomach. I said. I know, what kind of dumbass move is that? Uh, but I was a kid. What kid isn't a little curious about what goes on inside of him? Danny clearly didn't expect my enthusiastic consent, but she did a little dance in place before glancing around. <laughs> no one else is out here. But uh, uh, let's go behind the bushes just in case, she said. Excitement brimmed between the two of us. We hid behind the bushes as I laid down on the ground, staring up at the gray sky. It was peaceful back here. Okay, uh, just start checking, I said. Danny knelt above me, and her cold fingers ran over my chest. I tried not to squirm since I was so ticklish. For several quiet seconds, I, I just laid there, wondering when she'd start. You can start whenever. I said, thinking she was losing courage. I've already started. I glanced down, and sure enough, she had. I hadn't felt a thing, but my skin over my torso had been opened right up, cut down from the top of my sternum to below my belly button. Skin, muscle, and ribs were just pulled open into the side so Danny could dig around in my guts. She slid open my stomach and I saw the remnants of digested food. The pancakes I'd had for breakfast. She sealed that back up quickly, so nothing was disturbed as she proceeded to run her fingers through my intestines. So cool, I whimpered, afraid if someone caught us now. The little spell she had put over me would be broken. I'm not even bleeding. It was true. Not a single blood drop lost, and nothing seemed desperate to pop out of me either. It was just there. I could see my heart beating, my lungs inflating and deflating with each level breath. I should have been afraid, but I, I wasn't. I was just fascinated to see what was going on inside of my body. There's something wrong. Danny scowled as she continued to prod. And then I felt a bit of searing pain. Careful! I hissed. Sorry! Oh, I, I don't know how, but I think something is really wrong in here. Hold still, I'm putting you back together. I stayed still as she finished zipping up my chest. I sat up and poked at my chest, as if I expected my seam to burst open and everything to come spilling out all at once. What do you mean, something's wrong? Danny shrugged. I, I don't know, I, I don't. I just looked around in there and something doesn't feel right to me. Talk to your mom, 
I think she needs to take you to the doctor. Did you really not feel anything when I cut your seam? I shook my head and got to my feet, grimacing as that pain from my gut flared up. Not a thing. You're awesome, Danny. I'm gonna go home now, though, I said. Please hurry. I went home and somehow managed to nag my mom long enough into taking me to the doctor's office about my stomach ache. Of course, I'm sure you guessed by now that it wasn't just a stomach ache. Appendicitis, they said. Luckily, it was all taken out before anything terrible could happen. But I was bedridden for two weeks. When I was finally well enough to play, I, I, I couldn't find Danny at the park. Asking around revealed that she hadn't been back since that rainy day. She was gone, and she didn't come back into my life until the beginning of this school year. I, I barely recognized her at first. I I'm not really a tall guy, but even compared to your average guy, Danny was practically a tree. She cut her hair short, and she'd grown up. But I saw her face, and I knew. Danny? I ran up to her and nearly plowed her over in my eagerness to get to her. Danny nearly jumped out of her skin as she looked down at me. <laughs> and then she realized who I was. Luca, is that you? She asked. I nodded eagerly, probably looking like an idiot. Yes! Oh, oh my god, Danny! You're tall, I said. When she smiled, I felt like I was a kid in the park, all over again. And you're still Luca. I'm so glad. I'm so glad to see you, she said before, giving me a quick hug. Do you have lunch next period? We can talk then, uh, catch up? I, I barely touched my food because I, I was just too excited to talk to Danny. She was on the girls' basketball team and was already saving up money for college in a few years. She wanted to be a vet. Meanwhile, all I did was join the school's anime club and still have no idea what I want to do for a living. But she still listened. We didn't talk about... seams. It was a silent agreement between us not to. I, I knew it happened. It wasn't something I made up, but... the seams were something from childhood. We didn't need to open them up again. Well, we didn't until Danny was hit by a car and left to die by the side of the road. I only heard about it the following morning. One of her team members tracked me down to tell me. Apparently I was the only person outside of the team that was friends with her. Danny always worked late, and while she was walking home, some Drunken joyriders plowed her over. She was found hours later, somehow still alive and taken to the hospital. Several bones, including both legs and one arm, were broken. Ribs cracked. She was concussed and had lost a lot of blood. She'd be okay in the end, but there was a long road to recovery ahead of her. I nearly cried the first time I visited her in the hospital. Gratefully, she was sleeping at the time, so she didn't hear me sniffling. But I left her a card. It was sitting on her lap when I visited her the next day. And she was awake. But along with her body, her, her heart had been broken too. I'm never going to play basketball again. Don't say that. I tried to soothe her. Danny snorted. Even if I can walk again, I'll never walk without a limp. And running will be flat out. It's not a big deal. The way she shuddered when she said, not a big deal, quickly gave away that it was, in fact, a big deal. I held her hand, and she squeezed her eyes tight as she struggled not to cry. I don't know what to do. They have no idea who hit me. I I know it. I, I know. I know it was a black truck. That's all. They ruined my life, and they're not even gonna pay for it. She said, "Danny, do you uh, do you remember the seams?" 
Danny jolted like I'd hit her with a bolt of electricity. What about seams? She asked cautiously. I pulled up my shirt to show off my appendectomy scar. You were right that day about what was wrong. I, I might be dead by now if you didn't find my seam and look inside. I remember them. But do you? You've never forgotten. Her good hand stroked mine, and I watched as the skin split over the back of my hand. Another touch and it sealed right back up. Good as new. It's... it's why I want to be a vet. Do you know how many animals I could save with my gift? That's amazing, I said, flexing my hand. That day in the park, you didn't come back after that. Danny nodded. I... I scared myself a bit after I cut you open. And when you didn't come back the next day, I... I started having nightmares that your chest exploded, and all of your organs slid out of you. I couldn't want to go to the park if you weren't there. Anyway, her brow furrowed. Why are you bringing this up now? I can't heal myself. I, I can only close a seam I opened. I swallowed before leaning in close and lowering my voice. Does opening a seam... Half to be painless. It took a second for Danny to get it. But she shook her head. It can hurt as much as I want it to, she said, her gaze turning cold. Then leave the rest to me. You work on getting better. And I promise I am going to find out who did this to you. It did take months to track them down, but I got help. The girls' basketball team, they... they want to help Danny. And all I said was I was going to get her justice. They put their feelers out. And we got something. Corey. I never really knew Corey. He ran in a different crowd. But he had a black truck, drunk like a fiend, and rumor had it he bragged to a few close friends that he ran over that goth bitch, also known as my friend, Danny. My first instinct was just to go up and punch him in the face, but I knew that wouldn't work. I'd just get expelled, so I did the next best thing. I knew Corey was a terrible student, and we take the same bus to school. I waited. I waited until I heard him bitching about struggling with last night's math homework. And then I turned around. Hey man, um, if you need a bit of help, I can double check your work. Fill in all the right answers if you missed any. He looked baffled, but handed me the paper. I tried my best not to cringe at how god-awful his handwriting was. Uh, but I corrected his work and handed it back just as we got to school. The next day, Corey slung his arm around my shoulders and said, Pal, buddy, I got a hundred percent on that last assignment. I think this is the start of something beautiful. I smiled back at him. I think it is, I replied. So yes, for the last month, I became Corey's personal slave. I finished his homework, and in return, he was somewhat nice to me. He also blabbed. A lot. And it was so hard not to just wreck his face when he told me about the night he ran over the goth. But I just thought of Danny in physical therapy, doing her damn best to walk again. And I just smiled and laughed. I got the names of the two other guys in his car. His closest friends, Jay and Thomas. I waited. The waiting was the hardest part. And I'm pretty sure my grades slid a bit while I was doing both Corey's homework and my own. But it was all worth it for tonight. Because tonight, Corey and his friends were at a party. 
and I swung by at around midnight to see them, stumbling out of the house, laughing their drunk asses off. I rolled down my window and called out their names, offering them a ride. They'd no doubt get pulled over in their condition, and hey, I had some more booze in my car. They could keep the party going! In my back seat. Me. I was just the ass-kissing nerd that had been doing Corey's homework for the past week. They had never even considered that I drugged the beers I so happily handed to them in the back seat. One by one, they passed out, and I went into phase three of my plan. I'd planned ahead. I'd let three basketball team members know that the kind of justice I was looking for wasn't by getting them arrested and having them serve a nothing sentence while Danny was going to struggle for so much longer with the injuries they gave her. I knew these three would go with it. They'd set up the perfect place. A basement in an abandoned building. I was impressed by how much effort they put into it. Plastic was rolled over the floor and part of the walls. There was a pile of zip ties and three chairs set up in the center of the room. Now, the hard part was dragging their unconscious asses down there. By the time I got the last one down there, I was sweating like a pig. Oh, but oh, it was all worth it when I brought Danny there. And she saw all three of them tied up and just starting to stir. She softly gasped as she looked between them. And you're sure these are the guys? She asked quietly. I nodded and gestured to them. Do whatever you want, I said. Danny grinned ear to ear before she walked up to them. Corey was the first to really come to, his eyes fluttering, and he groaned before saying, Oh, how much did I drink last night? Too much, Danny chirped, pacing back and forth in front of her prey. That woke him right up. Corey's head shot up, and all of the blood rushed out of his face as he recognized the girl in front of him, still walking with a crutch to support herself. He, of course, immediately tried to play dumb. Do I know you? Because I've dated a lot of girls. I can't really keep track of them. Danny slugged him across the face. I'm the girl that you ran over with your truck, she said. Still smiling, Jay and Thomas had woken up from their beauty sleep by this time. Corey spat out a mouthful of blood before looking up and smirking at Danny. <sighs> Sorry? I don't remember you, he said, smugness oozing out of the creep. Danny circled the trio of hungover morons, watching how Jay flinched every time he heard the sound of her crutch hitting the ground. I think he remembers, she hummed, before she paused in front of Jay. Jay swallowed before glancing at the others. No, I don't. No. No, no, no. No, I don't. I don't. He mumbled. Danny cocked her head to the side before she lifted her hand. She waggled her fingers and then caressed the middle one right up his jawline and over his cheekbone. Jay barely realized that his cheek was hanging from the last inch of connecting flesh before Danny just grabbed it and ripped it right off. Jay screamed at the top of his lungs, blood pouring down his mangled face and down his neck. See his teeth and gums. The others looked on in horrified silence as Danny dropped the piece of flesh to the plastic. Let's try again. Do you remember now? Yes. Yes. Jay wailed, tears sprouting at the corners of his eyes. But it wasn't me. It wasn't me driving. It, it was Corey. 
I, I thought we'd just hit a deer or something, but... In the morning, we heard about you. I, I wanted to tell someone, I swear. But they wouldn't let me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Danny hummed and nodded as Jay continued to babble his desperate apologies. I believe you. So you won't suffer any longer, she said, right before she drew her finger right across Jay's neck. So much blood poured down the front of his shirt, a waterfall of blood splattering against the plastic as Jay's head lulled down. He certainly didn't suffer. He was dead in minutes. And all during those minutes, Thomas and Corey were screaming in terror. Any of Corey's smugness it had vanished when Danny ripped open his friend's face and cut his throat. Danny turned her murderous stare onto the other two, still smiling ear to ear. Thomas glanced down at her hand and realized it first. Where's... Where's your knife? He stammered. All she did was raise her hand into the air and waggle her fingers. These are my knives. I've always been a bit special, she said, carefully avoiding the blood puddle as she limped over to Thomas. And even though I'll probably never play basketball or have my full mobility again, you can't take away my gift. Find the seam in everything. With just a brush of her fingers, she sliced through Thomas's jersey, and although he begged for his life, she just slowly dragged her hand from his stomach up to his collarbone while he howled in agony, watching his skin just split by her touch was mesmerizing. The cut was so precise it was like a surgeon's scalpel. Another slice over the gut, and everything just spilled out. This was nothing like letting her find my seam in childhood, where everything just stayed perfectly still. Ha! Huh. I never knew how long the intestines were until I watched them plop on the floor, still twitching and alive. Thomas stared in horror his disemboweled guts until Danny drove her hand into his chest and I heard the loudest squish. Thomas's eyes rolled back and he almost immediately expired. Danny pulled out the remnants of his heart before throwing them on the ground. Corey was crying now, snot dribbling down his lips as he pulled frantically at his zip ties. Please! It was an accident! It was just an accident, you crazy bitch! As he yelped, she trotted in front of him. Danny had been smiling until Corey called her a crazy bitch. The smile dropped, and she sighed, crossing her reddened arms across her chest. Was it an accident that you drove drunk? Or was it an accident that you just drove away? He didn't even attempt to call 911. Was it an accident you've spent all your time until now laughing about running me over? Maybe I am a crazy bitch. Maybe I am. But if I'm crazy, then you're a downright sociopath, and odds are you'll kill someone else the next time an accident happens. She knelt to his level and flicked his nose, watching the tip go flying off and sticking to the wall. Corey crossed his eyes to see the damage and promptly pissed himself. I could see the stain in his jeans. Hey, <laughs> Corey! Danny giggled, 
her smile returning and bordering on maniacal. <laughs> you ever hear of um, a torture called death by a thousand cuts? I'm just taking a break. Corey and Danny are still in the basement. Uh, last I saw him, though, he barely even looked like a person anymore. She'd removed his uh, lips, nose, ears, eyelids. He's bald, cuts covering his entire scalp. Dozens of surgical cuts are decorating his arms, legs, torso. And he's still alive, staring unblinkingly. Someplace past begging in tears. But she's not going to let him die just yet. After all, she's been suffering for months because of that accident. He can take a few days before she finally lets him go. I hope you enjoyed There's a Seam in Everything, as written by Kitty Olsen and brought to life by Luke Fisher. If you dig Kitty Olsen's work, simply search for her on Amazon, where you'll find her many books for print, including her fantastic miniseries collection, Wedding Bells, or visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Olsen, spelled O-L-S-E-N, and you'll be redirected to her author page on Amazon, where by clicking through via that link, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. In Wedding Bells, you'll see that everyone experiences love in a different way. The Snow family is a little more passionate about this love. Some say they might even go a little mad. The book tells the story of four different love stories of the snows. Wedding Bells. Adam would tell everyone who asked how he met Eliza that they met on the internet. It was the truth, but it wasn't the whole story. The whole story is much more bizarre. Lover Boy Some called Ambrose Snow a womanizer. Those less tasteful called him a man-whore, but he considers himself to be a man who knows what he wants, and nothing stops him from getting it. Puppy Love First love is important to everyone, and the name of Eliza's first love was a boy named Jacob Boone. As I hold my love dying. Finally, the story of how Abraham met Emmeline, the woman who would be the mother of his children, Ambrose and Eliza. So don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Olson and pick up your copy of Wedding Bells today and let Kitty know that Steve Taylor and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights sent you it would mean a lot to me. As for voice actor Luke Fisher, more of his work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel dating all the way back to 2012. Be sure to check him out when you can. I assure you, you won't be disappointed. Thanks again for your support of tonight's talented authors and of indie horror. And with that, listeners, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.